It's good to see all the serious students of the Druidic secrets come together to celebrate the most serious holy day of the year. It is the day of the dead. We celebrate ego death. Following which we all become saints. So enjoy your sins while you can, because tomorrow is all saints day and none of this will be allowed. But tonight it is all allowed, everything, very loud, <laughs> because tonight we get to the core of the real. Other holidays are fluff and nonsense, celestial voodoo, children's fairy tales. But tonight we study the real. We become the real. <laughs> You've done a good job displaying your real nature. <laughs> I knew it. Indeed. Well, tonight I'm going to begin by giving you a very serious class in the history of Halloween. And I think everyone should know the history because it is your own mystery, your own disastrous fall into the night of time. Halloween is the celebration of the pole shift. It is the moment when that moment of the year occurs in which the light shifts into the darkness. But it is also that moment when the normal shifts into the paranormal. It is that moment in which rationality dies into the irrational. And all the ordinary types morph into their archetypes. This holiday celebrates the achievement of the morphogenetic shift of consciousness into chakra five. Leaving behind the ordinary world and seeing the world as it is a costume show, a holographic illusion, and who tonight could possibly believe that this world is real? Just look around and see how unreal everyone is. <laughs> Do you know how unreal you are? Not just tonight, but every day. And so, to get to the roots of the history of Halloween, we have to go much further back in time. We have to go back to the origins of the reason for human emotional instability. And the human predilection for predicting apocalyptic demises of the planet. The reason why these predictions, these foretellings of disaster, of planetary death arise in every culture is not because their prophets can foresee the future. It's because it already happened in the past. There's a remembrance, even breaking through the amnesia of the ego, of a time at the end of the Silver Age, 
when that peaceful kingdom of the gods and goddesses of Treta Yuga fell through the collapse of the soul into the ego, and it was accompanied by disastrous geological shifts of tectonic plates, but also of a war between two kingdoms, a nuclear war that is today remembered as an ultimate holocaust. But then there was a second destruction that is also remembered, and the two must not be confused, which occurred between the Dwapar Yuga and the Kali Yuga, which existed also in the form of climate change that dried up the Saraswati River and ended the Harappan civilization of the Copper Age and created mass migrations and desertification of the, what became the Sahara Desert, the end of the Egyptian kingdom, the end of all of those kingdoms of the world that were signified with the monolithic construction of pyramids, including the Mayans and the Viracocha and all of those peoples who have disappeared from time. Because at one time, the great center of civilization was what is now called Antarctica. But it was at that time because of a pole shift, an equatorial land. And then later, another pole shift brought it into the Arctic rather than the Antarctic. And only now has it become that South Pole, which again is melting and about to reveal the secrets of lost civilizations of a higher sort. But it was in that moment of the shift of the yugas, of the mass migrations, of the beginnings of a reconstitution of society at the beginning of Kali Yuga, that the leaders had to make a great decision. Should society be based upon male psychology or female psychology? And this was a great debate. And the two leading rulers of the time who are depicted and described in the Rig Veda as Tvastar and Danu, the father and the mother of the civilization of the Aryans, had three children, Manu, Indra, and Vishvarupa. Indra wanted a male psychology for society, a patriarchy. And Vishvarupa said, no, we'll have wars if we do that. We have to have a society ruled by a queen and based upon love and harmony. And the third was Manu. And Manu said, can't we have an androgynous society in which we unite the male and the female psychologies into a single whole? And this argument went on for some time, but finally it ended up in a power struggle. And those who were the followers of the female psychology option, who, who were the worshippers of Danu, the goddess, <clears throat> they were forced to flee. And they went north, they went west, and they, and they went northwest. In the north, they established the Tat Arya land, which later became called Tartaria. These followers of Danu went all the way directly into the Middle East, going west from India, and established the 
the uh, outpost called uh, Tel Dan, Dan meaning the follower of Danu, and they became later the tribe of Dan, and they settled by the Dan River, which flowed at the base of the Mount Hermon, at the border of the land that was then known as Surya, the land of the sun that's now called Syria. And so the tribe of Dan from Syria then moved out building ships and crossed the Mediterranean. And they went to a Greek isle called Mykonos. And there they built ships that could travel all the way around to Northern Europe. And while they were on Mykonos, they discovered that Mykonos also uh, cultivated magic mushrooms. Amanita muscaria grew in Mykonos. And they realized that these were equivalent of the soma that they had used to drink back in India. Well, these people were great carpenters. They built ships, and the word for carpenter was Phoniki, which later became the term Phoenician, and these were the Phoenicians. And they took the mushrooms with them from Mykonos, which became the origin of the study of mycology, or, or that of the way of cultivating and botanically understanding mushrooms. And they took their ship all the way to Ireland, what became Ireland. Ireland is simply a mispronunciation of Arya land. So they established the Aryan capital in Ireland. But this was the Aryan race that favored the female. And so they warded off the male invaders and they had gargoyles that were of a female form with gaping vaginas that scared away the men. They called these Sheila Nagigs. I don't know if any of you have seen a Sheila Nagig but they put them on the castles and they put them on the, later after St. Patrick came on the churches of all places, <clears throat> but they represented both life and death. They represented the void. They represented that terror of the female that the men all secretly harbored. And so they became known because they were the followers of Danu, the goddess from India, as the Tuatha de Danan. And they were the people who then developed into that culture known as the Celts and with their priest kings, the Druids. There's much more to be said about them. But the other Danavas, as they were called, took river boats and went up the rivers of Europe, which is why all the rivers are called something like Don or Danube or Dniester or Dnieper or any of those other names. And the D became an R, became the Rhone and the Rhine, etc. All the rivers were named after the Danu, the Danavas. And then they, of course, in, in Ireland became the Dons and the Duns, and wherever they went, even in the desert, they renamed them as the Dunes. But all of these places were inhabited and claimed by the daughters, the followers of, of Danu. The, the followers of the male psychology shifted out of India, but not far. They went to another Arya land called Iran, same meaning, same word. But there they established a patriarchy. And that patriarchy brought about an ideology called Zoroastrianism with the belief of two gods. And they took the Asuras and they made them into gods. So you had Asura Mazda, who became later called Ahura Mazda. He was the good god and the bad god was Ahriman. But it was a struggle between these two forms of male psychology, later famous in the Frankenstein film. But these two forms of male psychology then developed and uh, the Iranians uh, supported the establishment of Zionism because, you know, the tribes were expelled and, and found themselves in Babylon, which was then the capital of the Persian Empire. And from there, of course, uh, this 
entire Judeo-Christian line of patriarchal male god, uh, god of power and destruction attitude prevailed. And uh, the Roman Empire was taken over by this uh, force and this ideology. And eventually the followers of the, the queen, the feminine power, which became known as the dragon. There were the two forces, the sun and the dragon. In some places, the dragon is considered evil. In other places, it's magical. In China, for example, the dragon is considered a wonderful, uh, protective creature of great power, and one sits on the dragon throne. But in other areas where the male power is dominant, the dragon is evil, and the dragon, of course, is the name for Dracula. And all of these forces that were defeated by the male psychology-based culture that conquered Kali Yuga. And so in Ireland, the last hope of that feminine power in its struggle with the masculine was fought on this holiday of Samhain, or Samhain, as it would, looks like it should be pronounced, which is actually a translation of Sangam, the confluence of these forces of light and dark. And the forces fought themselves out to a draw on this night. But gradually, the powers of the paranormal that were enhanced by the drinking of soma, by the taking of the magic mushrooms that would bring altered states of consciousness. The mushrooms in Ireland were taken care of by the people from Mykonos who became known as the McKenna clan. Mm -hmm. And even now the McKennas are very much in charge of the dissemination of the magic mushroom. But it's this that became the power that was used by the feminine host in order to disrupt the male ego and dissolve boundaries and enable a kind of unitive love again to prevail, if only for one evening. But this was the entire meaning, to go beyond that boundary of light and dark and unite these two forces so that at least one night of the year there could be the realization of the true meaning of love. But it was not to last. It was only later, in the establishment of the Middle Ages, that the relationship between the man and the woman became stabilized for several hundred years, thanks to the feudal system that regulated the relationship of male and female. And it was this system then that developed such uh, ways of interacting that were known as courtly love, in which the man treated the woman in a very pure and Madonna-like way of love without desire. And this also was uh, supported by the development of the monasteries and the ashrams of those who, and the monasteries came from Manu, by the way, the third brother, who realized that one must sacrifice gender and desire if one was to reach God consciousness in which the peace of the man and the woman could be established in a stable way. But it was to happen that the feudal system was destroyed beginning in the 12th century AD by the coming of romantic love. Romantic love destroyed the Middle Ages. It began with that uh, story of Tristan and Isolde, in which the love that broke the law was valorized over the love that kept the law. And then infidelity, once valorized, destroyed the trust of men with men, men with women, women with women, and society gradually decomposed, the Middle Ages fell apart, and a brutal and savage capitalism replaced it. 
And here we have truly the beginning of the ghouls taking over the world, when the world would become Halloween in its worst and most degraded form, in the form of war and deception and darkness of every kind. And so now we are at that moment in which the evil forces have become hegemonic over the forces of light. And for the forces of light to return and to gain victory, we must again enter into the precincts of the god Agni. We must become the fire, the fire of sacrifice, of body consciousness, and of gender difference, and reach that radiant sameness of the unitive love that knows no otherness, neither subject nor object. And it's that love that we are here to celebrate as the apotheosis of All Hallows' Eve.